it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here, so thank you very much for the invitation. And Michael, wherever you are, thanks for your support in all the preparation and the logistics. Um, most importantly, thank you to all of you who've, uh, again, very generously given up an hour of your, your day to attend. Um, so I, um, um, I'm flattered by that, and I, I've, I hopefully will give you something uh, meaningful to take away and uh, hopefully some inspiration. Um, can I just start by asking very quickly, quick show of hands, just how many of you are, are or your organization w would you say are actively utilizing AI today? Great. Yourself? You? You're from Deloitte. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and yourself. Okay, great. Okay. How many of you would say that you're quite fluent in AI? You know, you 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 kind of you know your your A's from your B's. Okay, so that probably makes the job of a, an AI masterclass a little bit easier. So that's a, that's a good start. Okay, um, look, if there is a purpose to the talk, which I, which you'd like to think there is, it I don't. I'm not an evangelist, and I don't have a point of view, and I'm not selling anything for Deloitte. Um, what I am trying to do is get you to think, and I'm really passionate about trying to get people involved in the debate and try and make this a very inclusive uh, and engaging discussion that shouldn't be about IT. Uh, we've made that mistake in the past. Um, if I refer back 10 years ago to digital, where we said, well, let's, let's give it to IT to figure out how to do it. Um, did a great job, but this is something that everybody should be involved in. So if tomorrow your CEO stops you and says, where are we with our AI strategy? And your answer is, talk to Bob in IT, then I haven't done a good job tonight. So I hope leaving here, you will feel that kind of agency to say, no, I've got a role to s and, and a voice to, to, be, to, to be heard here. Um, look, I'm gonna move quite quickly. Uh, the thing about AI is it's very broad and there's a lot to cover. So I'm gonna batter through this and uh, hopefully with, with sort of a broad audience, it's hard to know where to pitch it. So I've kind of had to make some assumptions common denominators so some of it you know you may have heard before some of it might be new but um i'm going to start with a little bit about me because i actually think it's quite helpful to give a bit of context um you know about where i am in my life and what's important to me and how that kind of links back to why i'm passionate about this um, i'm going to talk a little bit about some market insights share some sort of what we're seeing and kind of where things are going and give you a perspective on that and talk a little bit about um, the kind of human-centric side as well towards the end. Um, I do hope that we can get some discussion going, whether during it or at the end. I'll try and answer questions. Uh, if you ask it, I will try and be honest and give you a straight-up answer, if I can. Um, but more importantly, I just hope some of you share your opinions and perhaps you know tell us what you think. <coughs> so, a little bit about me. Uh, my greatest achievement was to persuade that woman uh, to get out of that car 11 years ago. Um, and so far, she, she hasn't got back in the car. Um, six years ago, he came along. And like many of you who have children, that changed everything. And I could not have understood how much I would enjoy watching how a child learns about the world and how a child learns to ingest stimuli about the external world and translate that and process it. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, Izzy's the baby, 16 months old, um, 20 words to her credit, which I think is not bad. Um, I want to come back to little Izzy. She is um, a dote, but I'm told that she'll probably burn the house down when she's 15, that you always pay for it later on. Uh, so I'm going to come back to her. And then we've got these two. Um, and some rather unkind people in my household would suggest that if there was a fire, God forbid, uh, it's not clear who I would rescue first. But um, this is what I love to do. Uh, I bagged tickets for the killers this morning. So I uh, love music. I'm very grateful to Spotify for the, uh, the artificial intelligence that they use to curate playlists on my behalf where they compare me to lots of you and they see that we like lots of the same music and then the music I don't have, they drop into my playlist because they think oh, I might like it um, and they use natural language processing. So like all of us, you know, we're all using AI and we're using it to good effect. Um, 
So I'm going to circle back around to the point uh, um, about my background. I have a PhD from Trinity in neuroscience. So I'm, it's, like, it's great for me just to kind of make the circle here because I was, I was studying how the brain codes information, how we learn and how we memorize. And obviously that's very relevant in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, Currently, I work for, for these people, which, again, is fantastic. Really enjoy that experience. Um, but if I had to try and say what I'm passionate about and what gets me out of bed in the morning, it's probably just trying to get people to be digital. Um, and by that, I don't mean technology. I'm really talking about trying to get people to think and work differently. And um, that's what graduates want. That's what they expect. Um, and I think it's sort of as a duty of care for us to try and provide that. Um, the second thing is about, I think Liam touched on it, there's, there's an opportunity here. The narrative that has been portrayed in the national press, in the papers, in LinkedIn, about this robots versus humans, this is just nonsense. Um, that's, that's not how this is going down. This is a, about a collaboration. Um, and I'm passionate about trying to get that message out. I'm also passionate about that um, when people talk about AI, um, you know, if an AI is going to mirror what a human does, it's not really doing the job of an AI. So, so there's a little bit about trying to readdress that. So, okay, let's jump into it. Uh, a good place to start is, is with a definition. And the problem with AI is there isn't a definition. So I think if we asked everybody in the room, you'd all have a slightly different view of what AI is. So I'm just going to ask you to, to go with this. Uh, it serves a purpose. And what I'd encourage you to think about is, um, you know, it's a loose definition, and that's helpful. Um, the operative word here is where a, a, a machine or a, or a system is doing a task that re normally requires human intelligence. I think that is, the, that is the key piece here, and leave it as broad as that. Now, I'm going to try and kind of dig into that a little bit, and I'll take three examples. So um, maybe the first example is um, computers, shown my age, are really good at talking to each other. Uh, they have their own code. They have their own languages. But they're dreadful at talking to humans. And humans' natural language um, um, has always been a, a problem. But in the last few years, we've got much better at this. We've got much better at getting computers to be able to um, take voice or indeed written text and translate that um, and extract the, the meaning or the semantics from keywords in that text and take the sentiment from voice and stitch it together and figure out, well, there's an intent here. And that's really powerful. If you think an example of a call center, um, a customer rings up and they're, on t they're, they're talking to a, a chatbot and they're distressed or they're vulnerable. Perhaps they've lost their job. So it's in their voice and the language they're using is about maybe redundancy, I've lost my job, I, c I can't make the repayments, I can't pay the mortgage. Um, that allows the bot to channel that call straight to a human. So there are very smart things going on and that people are doing. Um, that's a good example. A second example is in the area of, of, of image recognition. So. Um, the ability to take images, whether it's a picture or a document. So I'll take the example of maybe an invoice, something we're all familiar with. And to classify that document and extract information from that document. That kind of um, image recognition and translation into machine-readable text where you can then action some sort of uh, intent off the back of that. Another example is, and I'll go back to Izzy earlier on, um, machine learning. How many people in the room know what machine learning is? It's quite a few, okay, it's good, that's very good. So um, I always think when, I'm, when people ask me about machine learning, uh, uh, sort of a nice analogy is, um, when I'm with Izzy, I will say to her, I will present an image to her, uh, like uh, a bedtime story, and I'll say, that's a cat. So I'm effectively labeling the picture of the cat. Uh, and then we'll be out for a walk in the buggy and the cat will go by and I'll say, that's a cat. So that image in her brain has now been labeled for her. And then we're watching TV and Tom and Jerry are on and I'll say, that's a cat. And that data is effectively a training set for her 16-month-old brain. 
and what it, it might seem like it's interminable when you're watching Peppa Pig or something, but actually in a very short period of time, a, a young person, a young human being who is utterly unremarkable except to her parents, um, is able to learn based on that training data um, to recognize an image of a cat and classify it. So I think it's amazing she'll go cat. Um, that effectively is what humans do naturally. It is a miracle and it is incredible. Um, and at the same time, they're developing very fine motor skills. So like, humans are really incredible and very impressive. That's effectively a very simple form of machine learning. Even in modern hospitals, the primary alert system between a patient and nurse is a light and a bell. That can mean anything. It's a system that fails to acknowledge or prioritize a patient's needs, which leads to staffing inefficiency, extra stress on nurses, and in serious cases, this can be the difference between life and death. To change this for the Prince of Wales Hospital, we thought we'd put a nurse bedside 24-7. So say hello to voice-activated bedside assistants, the next generation in hospital care, powered by natural language processing and machine learning. Alexa, tell the nurse I'm in pain. Deloitte Assist understands a patient's spoken request. Can you tell me where you're feeling the pain? Prioritizes and allocates it. They'll be with you shortly. Ensuring the right help comes sooner. Deloitte Assist collects data from each patient's request to understand future patients' requirements. Using these insights, hospital management can match the right staff to the right shifts. In initial testing, Deloitte Assist has significantly reduced response times against industry benchmarks while increasing time for care. And Deloitte Assist doesn't just look after patients. The nurse knows straight away what the patient needs. Instead of having them to make them do two or three trips, they can come and just do the one and go attend to someone else. It, it's innovation in patient care, so that we can give the best care possible for our patients. There's too many examples in healthcare where we've rolled out systems that actually make it more complicated for our staff to care for patients. This is immediately an example that's made our staff's life easier and our patients' life easier. Deloitte Assist. Care that's always there. Um, so, what the reason I showed you that video, and there's like there's obviously there's hundreds of videos on YouTube, and you can pick any of them. I showed you that one because what's wonderful about it is the guy who's behind that. His father was in hospital, and his father was prone, lying out on a on a bed, and he he, he said there has to be a better way here. So it ca the, the, this came from a very like a a, a real uh, a problem. Uh, it it wasn't like a technology looking for a solution. Um, what you saw there. Again, um, the voice recognition piece, so the translation of natural language into text, um, the comparison of that text to, a, uh, to, to, to test data, to a training data, which looks for keywords. Those keywords help identify and triage and prioritize that request. So if the keyword is um, glass of water, or if it's I've fallen, or I'm in pain, um, a, a red, amber, green triaging system on ServiceNow can alert the nurse at the at the station um, as to what how to allocate and prioritize the work. So it's very practical, very simple. What's nice is that wherever the nurse happens to be around the hospital, they get a ping on their mobile phone and they know what the problem is, what the urgency is, and they know what they need to do. So it just kind of, it really works. What's lovely is you could show that to your granddad, to your grandmam, to anybody, and you don't have to mention artificial intelligence, and that's the way it should be. It shouldn't be that you need to say, well, there's machine learning here, because I can guarantee you one thing, nobody's ever gonna go into a shop and say, I wanna buy some machine learning, right? So, I'm gonna take you in a different direction now. Um, this is a quote from an eminent uh, data scientist, Andrew Nag, who, um, I, I saw this and I just absolutely loved it. I just thought, this, this is it, this says it all. It was a couple of years ago, um, Electricity is ubiquitous, yet n no really, nobody really knows what it looks like. It's everywhere, it fuels everything we do. And I just thought it was a perfect parallel. Um, but it started to get me wondering, well, what was it like the first time around with electricity? 
um, you know, how do they kind of approach that and what can we learn from it? So I went digging in the ESB archives and I found this. And I wonder, is there anyone in the audience who's working in marketing? Yes? What do you think of that headline? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it's just, it, it, do you want to tell us back quickly, tell the backstory to this? Thank you, sir. What's your name? Bevan. 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 Thank you. That was not, that was not staged. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think any a marketing executive would be proud of that. It's a fantastic headline. It could be electricity. It could be AI. The fact that it's 1928, I find sort of humbling and kind of makes me check myself. Um, so what it forced me to do, and Bevan teed me up, is I started digging into this, and I wondered how did they advertise electricity in the 20s? And you know what? I found three things. The customer was at the center of every advertisement. And I thought management consultants invented uh, customer centricity about five years ago, right? No, no. Second thing, there was always business, uh, uh, sorry, a customer's you know, benefit. That's what the, the, the ad was about. Uh, they would say, um, for example, the length of the working day will no longer be bound by the sun. Or, Perishable foods are no longer a, a problem because you've got a fridge, right? Or this one, uh, where you can, this little Lizzie in 10 years carrying her radiator up the stairs to heat her bedroom because, you know, you could do that now, right? Um, so really wonderful, very humbling. No mention of technology, nowhere. They didn't talk about how electricity is generated. You didn't need to know that. The customers didn't care. So that's exactly how we should talk about AI, and that's exactly why we need people in the conversation now who represent the customer, who represent HR, who represent risk, who represent marketing. Um, and of course we need people from technology and analytics. So that's kind of the thing, you know, they didn't talk about server farms. There was no mention of mobile phones. There was no mention of blockchain. They didn't know about these things, but there was a bit of a leap of faith that electricity will power things and generate things. And I think that's what we need to kind of think about now. We, we don't know what jobs will be created by AI, but we know that things will uh, improve. So a bit of a cynics view. Um, we've heard this before with AI. There's been a few kind of false dawns, whatever you want to call it. So you might say, well, why is it different now? the kind of gold rush to California, what's, what's like, is it, is it really gonna last or should I sit in the fence? Um, I'm not gonna spend time on this because I presume everybody in the room has kind of heard this before. We've got tons of data, we've got really smart algorithms and the, c the, the price of cloud computing and storage has plummeted. And when you put all those three together, you have all the, 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 the secret sources for this stuff to work. Um, Somebody believes it because there's a ton of investment gone into the sector. Um, this is just showing you sort of the number of deals and, uh, and investments over the last few years. And I interestingly, in the secondary market, we've seen the emergence of um, mutual funds and ETFs that only track AI companies. And this little figure here, the orange is the S&P 500, which is kind of a broad reflection of the US equity market. And Tracking it fairly faithfully, for the most part, as expected, is, is those uh, uh, AI-type tech firms. There's a bit of a wobble there. Liam could probably explain that, but I imagine it's probably just a correction. There was probably a bit of enthusiasm, a bit of a bubble for a couple of years. So, like, bottom line is there's a lot of funds and cash flowing into this. And, 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 the, and the other barometer that I think is really interesting is there's an absolute explosion in graduates in data science and in business analysts. And that's partly because of demand, because kind of there's a need, but it's equally because of supply, because lots of online universities and physical universities are offering these degrees. So lots going on in the space. Um, not gonna spend time on this. Really other than to say that in the last two or three years, all the superpowers 
have come up with a strategy and a policy on AI. And it's quite interesting, if anyone wants any of this stuff or any of the detail, you can ask Michael and I'll share it. But the, the different sort of perspectives from the, the socialist French, where they're putting their AI investment into um, like universal health care, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, versus say, for example, you know, the, the Chinese, where it's all about attracting talent in and determined to be the AI superpower by 2030. Um, so interesting different perspectives. Um, so just to ground it a bit, AI is everywhere, but if you're, if you're thinking about what do we do about AI in our company, I think you need to be really careful uh, because there's lots of snake oil salesmen floating around and LinkedIn is full of it. You know, it's just people saying, I oh, have AI, we have AI, we can do this, we can do that. Um, that's not my experience. My experience and my advice is, if anyone's approaching you and they say they have a model or they have a solution, it has to be really narrow. It, it, it's back to the, it needs to be trained on something very, very specific. Um, if somebody says, well, we have a model that can be trained on different things, forget about it, right? Um, so to take that a bit further, you know, here's kind of a number of examples of roles that are up for AI, according to the press. So a kind of a manual labor, a barista role, that seems about right. You know, it's fairly predictable, fairly routine. Um, but you wouldn't ask that AI uh, on, a, on a slow afternoon to be a, a chauffeur in your self-driving car. That just doesn't work. AI doesn't work that way. It's very specific. It's not a general AI. Um, Interestingly, kind of high intelligence jobs that we would associate like a, like a surgeon, a doctor, a neurologist. Um, what's interesting here is it's, it's not so much the job that will be uh, automated, it's bits of the job. And, and one bit of, of, a, of, a, of a doctor's job looking at uh, MRI scans and comparing them to millions of other scans is infinitely done better by uh, a, a machine, right? So that is, is a great example of why that's where we need AI. And what we need AI is, is, to, is to think about that problem in a different way than a harassed doctor would. And then you allow the doctor to have the conversation with the patient. Um, the bottom right, I'm just gonna pause because I, I imagine the bottom right evokes very different uh, sentiment from people. Um, I, I would imagine there's a sense of concern, perhaps a sense of caring, maybe a sense of um, empathy. Um, and, and that's the point, is that none of the AI we're talking about are, have emotional intelligence. Um, the intelligence they have is very prescriptive and very limited, very powerful, don't get me wrong, but you know the, the role of parent or doctor or nurse is not something that I can personally see being uh, up for grabs anytime soon um, because, you know, as, as I'm, I'm sure there is a logical answer to whatever is going on in this young woman's head, um, it, it probably wouldn't land, and, th and that's kind of the point, right? So who's doing it? Well, it's no surprise. The people who are absolutely killing it are the people who have all the data scientists, all the data, and tons of cash, um, and they're doing it, and pretty much nobody else really is. So, you know, it is the usual suspects, and unfortunately for the rest of us, um, we're still trying to figure out how to be digital, and anyone in this room, I suspect, knows how difficult that has been in the last 10 years, right? Um, we kind of said, well, let's deal with the customer first and let's build apps that make the customer experience better it was fine but the plumbing and the connecting through to legacy systems and platforms is way more difficult than any of us really thought and it's a huge struggle for all of us to to be to digitize our businesses but these guys have digital first businesses they don't have that problem in the main and they are actively positioning themselves as ai first and that means that consumers expect the same experience from everyone else and that's a problem and again i would ask you you need to be involved in the conversation around ai because it's moving so fast that it isn't enough to think about well how do we sort of offer a sort of a multi-channel experience it's just not enough um 
like everything, the technology gets there and then it takes years to figure out how to sort of regulate it. And you can see that happening. I think a great example is about five years ago when I got really interested in this, everyone laughed about self-driving cars. It was just flaky Californians. It was never going to happen. We all laughed. And, well, I mean, we can do it. Uh, it the question now is how will it get regulated and, and, and how will it really be adopted? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I didn't want to sort of paint the picture that, you know, everything is, it, it's, it's all one way. There are clearly some very serious risks and concerns with AI. Um, the probably, you know, the one that's probably fairly obvious is the military, they're not really interested in self-driving tanks. Like, that's not where the billion dollars of, uh, of, of the, the, the budget funding is going. Uh, they're interested in, in building far more sinister um, ways of flattening cities and annihilating people. And that's just a reality, unfortunately. They are, you know, a, a leading sector. Um, and the idea of, you know, autonomous weapons is quite frightening, to be honest. Um, what we're seeing going on in, in certain states in China, for example, around sort of the social experiments is a I personally I find that really uncomfortable um but um you know the big question I always hear coming up is is there a kind of a, male a male male malevolent uh, sinister you know AI around the corner who's going to just sort of wipe us all out I don't know I'm not a prophet I really have no idea but if I had to place my money I would say that the threat that we will the internet will be underwater in the next 30 years is way higher than the threat that we'll have some sort of a, a AI sort of supreme being. Um, but again, there's a, there's a point here about artificial intelligence and the name artificial denotes uh, something is synthetic or false or, or not quite right. So it, it's automatically pigeoning human versus artificial intelligence as, 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 as a way of comparison. I don't think that's the right way to think about it. Um, first of all, AI should think differently than humans, otherwise we've missed a point. Um, and secondly, you know, to be honest, there's a bit of the kind of 16th century about of all this. There's a bit of a, well, we're at the center of the universe in terms of, you know, intelligence. Um, an AI that is any sort of self-respect, I'm thinking is gonna say, do I really wanna mimic human intelligence? You know, they are limited by, you know, physical and, 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 and carbon kind of challenges. So I'm not sure if that's the way AI will really develop. Um, I'm going to move into sort of a little bit, sort of wrap things up around uh, what does it mean to be digital. And um, to be honest, a very, very practical, very simple thing that HR and all of us need to think about is teams need to, we need to be aware that we're going to have human and, and, and digital workers in our teams. And this is quite profound for management. You know, traditionally, management people were promoted because they were they were good, they were technically strong, or they were good with people, uh, and you would hope it was the latter. Um, what happens though as you start to have robots, uh, software robots in your teams, or you start to have some you know sort of machine learning sitting in the business, or you have chatbots? Um, you need people who can sort of navigate that and who are technically fluent and tech fluency is a big challenge um the good news i think is and you know if there are sort of people who are thinking about a career in this you know there's three things you need t for ai you need the the hacker the engineer you need the data scientist and you need the business analyst and i'm going to go back to the esb to me the most important one is the business analyst it's the guy sitting beside the bed who goes, I see a problem here. I see a need. How do we bring AI into the need? I think that's the real, that is the real secret sauce here. Um, it is a reality. Um, one of the banks who had a very mature uh, robotic process automation capability already, we worked with them a couple of years ago, and we jointly built a solution that had 100 software robots. And that, uh, that did the work of about 900 people at a peak. And it, it helped, basically, the bank avoided the cost of hiring those people in an offshore location in a warehouse to do stuff um, and allowed them to put that 
you know uh, capital into customer centric um, activities so my point here is it's just it's real if people say well I don't really buy it it's not going to happen but it actually is happening this is just something to tr up as quick way we think about it I like to think about thinking about it from the customer on the left you know whatever channel the customer wants to engage whatever type of um, um, uh, data the customer is 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 offering you whether it's uh, their 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 physical presence in a, in a in a branch or a shop, whether it's uh, their voice on a telephone, whether it's an email, whether it's a fax, whatever, um, to be able to in the third panel capture, ingest, capture, and translate that data into a machine readable form and then process it either through a traditional workflow with humans or a, an automation workflow um, and then to be able to interrogate it on the right hand side this sort of process intelligence so it doesn't matter what business it is it could be a hospital it could be a bank it, it could be a pharmaceutical it really doesn't matter this is the way we like to think of it and the important point here maybe is it's not about a solution it's trying to understand that data is flowing from customer to the business and back how do you harness that data and massage it and manipulate it and stitching together different bits of uh, cognitive technology? Um, so a really great book, if I can recommend one, is called The Shallows. Um, it was a journalist who wrote it, whose name escapes me. Uh, and he wrote this about 10 years ago. It's frightening. He, he was just aware that his concentration was waning and he just found it harder and harder to think about things for more than like seconds and he noticed that on the he, on the internet at the time there was no mobile and um, he, he got really good at like skipping around and you know jumping from link to link but kind of never really concentrating so he wrote a book about it and what he uncovered is that for 25 years the internet has changed the way our brains are wired so i'm not talking about fake news here i'm not talking about content I'm just saying that our brains have been rewired um, tr tr through the internet um, and it makes it difficult to concentrate. It makes it difficult to think, it, it, trying to read things on screens. You know, I think everybody's familiar with this feeling. Um, but it has implications for the way we, we teach people and the way we you know, educate our, our children and so forth. Um, and to that extent, you know, the use of iPads in schools is interesting. You know, there's kind of pros and cons against it. Um, the, the, the sort of uh, emergence of lots of online universities is fantastic. The sort of access to all this information you can get is really important. And again, something to be encouraged. And just the idea that you, you basically can kind of, y y you know, your, 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 your working memory is working memory, but everything else could be d can be downloaded and kept off site. So, kind of just to, to finish up, um, when I started looking at robotic process automation, it was all about putting, um, the, taking the, uh, the robot out of the human. And where we've got to in a few years is, we've said, well, AI is putting the human into the robot. And I suppose there is a question, where does that leave us? And what I would like to encourage you is, is that I think it leaves us in a really good place. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it'll play out. It's a bit like the electricity. But I, I'm confident that if we can embrace AI and, you know, and we all engage in it and we make sure that these models don't have biases in them and that, you know, that they are controlled and discoverable and that, you know, um, we have a great opportunity. We have a great opportunity to free up people from routine, dull work and, and, and give them the space and capacity to do more interesting things. Um, what I will say, and this is a prophecy, is like bankruptcy, um, AI will happen um, very slowly and then very, very quickly. So I would encourage you, um, you know, when you're talking to your colleagues, um, if, if the conversation feels a bit tepid, try and ignite it and, um, and, and please have that agency. <laughs>